From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and coming up today, two of the featured speakers from the 2018 Nitrogen Use Efficiency Conference hosted this week by K-State. It attracted leading crop nutrient researchers from across the region. You'll hear today from Newell Kitchen out of the USDA. He'll talk about a new research initiative aimed at developing better decision-making tools for you producers to use in your nitrogen application management. And out of the University of Wisconsin, Carrie Lebowski will talk about her work on the timing of nitrogen applications and the ensuing environmental impact. Further ahead this week's K-State Horticulture segment, Raymond Cloyd is back to talk about dealing with still more insect activity in home landscapes and gardens. Right here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, agronomists here at Kansas State University have been playing host this week to quite a collection of researchers from the Midwest and the Central Plains region as they've assembled here in Manhattan for the 2018 Nitrogen Use Efficiency Conference. A whole host of topics being covered during this two-day event. And our guest now is one of the early presenters at the conference as he talked about enhancing corn nitrogen research through public-private partnerships. He's a USDA Agricultural Research Service soil scientist based at the University of Missouri. Newell Kitchen with us. Newell, first of all, thanks for joining us. And before we talk about your particular topic, a bit about this gathering and its significance in exchanging ideas on nitrogen management. So this uh, conference or workshop, uh, as we refer to it, has been going on about 20 years now. It got started through uh, the work of uh, Dr. Bill Ron and Dr. Jim Shepherds, really uh, their interest in nitrogen use efficiency, and really got it started with canopy reflectance sensing and uh, kind of that new technology back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, and so the emphasis is to come together to discuss, to share research, and really have some more intimate conversations in terms of how do we do a better job managing nitrogen in in our crops here in the Midwest. Does the conference tend to revolve around a handful of hot-button topics, or does it vary widely across the gamut? I would say it it has had some uh, sidebar stories with regards to... uh, you know, nutrient management in general, but it really has had a focus on nitrogen. And and certainly over the 20 years that this has been going, the attention by uh, society relative to nitrogen, its impact uh, relative to water and the, you know, Gulf of Mexico, there's been, I don't know how many stories that have highlighted the issues associated with lost nutrients off of, of crop fields. And so the public is has a much greater awareness of that issue, much more so today than 20 years ago. And so the uh, goal is from an agronomist, soil scientist, is to come up with uh, better ways of managing nitrogen and, and knowing full well. It's, I mean, it's, on a mass basis, it's the biggest input other than the seed itself, uh, you know, and crop production. And, and so there's a, a need to... To move towards getting it better. Will we ever get it absolutely right on? No, because of all of the craziness we have with weather and soil and those interactions and the difficulty of predicting those kind of outcomes. But in that spirit, talk about the initiative you were involved with and that you spoke about mm-hmm. at the conference. Again, uh, an overview, as it's titled, of a public industry partnership for enhancing corn nitrogen research and data. So two two difficulties. I mean, first off, there are a number of tools currently in place that producers have to try to make help them make that decision of how much nitrogen should I apply for this crop this year. Many of those tools 
go back and have decades worth of agronomic research behind them. And yet, for the most part, they kind of take a stab at one aspect of how we look at nitrogen and kind of the textbook view of the nitrogen cycle. You know, and many of us have looked at those different diagrams showing nitrogen in the soil and nitrogen in the crop and in the atmosphere and in lakes and streams and in manure and cover crops and all these different ways that nitrogen can move around and recognize that one little poke at that diagram and saying this is what now what we need to do based upon this poke is, is probably too simplistic of a way of looking at nitrogen. So we knew we needed to have some data sets that came together and came together in a way in a standardized Uh, way that allow us to examine the different tools that we currently have, for one, evaluate those tools in a side-by-side manner, but then also to step back and say, how do we use this data to to see how we can push the performance up? Is it taking two tools and working with those two or maybe even three tools simultaneously as opposed to thinking one tool alone is going to do it? Or is it taking a tool and and hybridizing it with information we would get with early season weather patterns or information and changing the tool to incorporate what is happening in the current year and having more site-specific soil information, too, to go into that. So that's that's really kind of the direction of this whole project is to put more uh, adaption, more dynamic into the decision-making of the tools. I had an interest in that. There was tremendous interest in the the public sector through the land grant institutions. Dupont Pioneer had an interest in that because they were uh, here about six years ago, entering into this idea of helping farmers make that decision. And they had their approach. They were willing to help to fund the research, provide the data set for them to be able to uh, work some of the details out in their tool. At the same time, we could take that same data and publish the science and get it out there to kind of move us in a direction of improving decision making. What is the status of this initiative then? Is there a tool or a suite of tools on the horizon or in place or still a bit down the road? So as we presented here this morning at the at the workshop is as a whole the tools kind of work decent if a nitrogen rate recommendation ended up being something in the kind of the middle. But on on sites where nitrogen need was low or it was very high, these tools kind of fail, and they fail big time. So that's the problem is the tools tend to be developed over many years and many different soils, and so they kind of gravitate to a recommendation that's kind of a middle of the road, and they fail to kind of deal with the issues or the years or the soils that end up having something that's on the ends. I, I don't need 180 pounds of nitrogen. I only needed uh, 60 pounds of nitrogen, or where we had sites that didn't need any nitrogen, you know, and still produce 240, 250 bushel per acre corn. And and that's that just like, well, how do you get a tool that helps you know when you've got that kind of condition so that you don't need to put on very much nitrogen? What kind of a tool helps you to recognize that, hey, because of what's happened with this year, we need 280 pounds of nitrogen to get to economic optimal end rate. So the tools by themselves did not perform well. What we did find, though, is that if we start to look at two or three tools that look at different aspects or they have different strengths, and you kind of weld those strengths together or fuse those tools together as a part of the recommendation, you get to a better recommendation, which is not too unlike really what the the companies, big companies that are providing the service of end recommendation, they're trying to do with crop growth modeling. They're trying to take the weather and the soil and the management records and bring that all together in some kind of a modeling exercise and then kicking that back out through their their platform to, to their customers saying, you know, given that we've had these conditions, this is where we think you're at. We think that if you're going to still expect to get a 200 40 bushel per acre crop off this field, you're going to have to add another 80 pounds or whatever. So in a lot of ways, that adaption is being approached from several different ways. No perfect tool is is out there yet, but we are, I think, really moving in the right direction. And in the meantime, Newell, as these new tools are being polished up, your, well, generic advice to producers on what they can do for the here and now in as far as more efficient use of nitrogen? Are are there sort of uh, tricks of the trade here that you would endorse? Well, certainly tools that take advantage of soil measurements in season and crop measurements in season seem to be the kind of thing that move us in the right direction. 
A lot of producers are leaning upon either drone images of their fields as well as satellite images, and there's even amazing data sets that are being built to show farmers, you know, the variation in color. And certainly if you go in the northern part of the Corn Belt this year, up in southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, and extending over to Wisconsin, you can see just tremendous modeling of greenness from the air. And farmers are realizing that their crops under great nitrogen stress because of the excessive rainfall they've had up there. So there's a lot of feedback. I have maintained all the way along in my career that some of the best agronomists are, the, are farmers that are out there and they're observing and they're looking and they're thinking about what they did and how their management may be different between one field and another. So the diagnostic tools of images, drone images, uh, the diagnostic tool of the yield monitoring system, looking at that, and particularly if they can put in some strips plus or minus 30 pounds relative to what they have been doing, might help them to see if they need to do a shift one direction or the other. Also helps them to see maybe where they have that spatial variability in fields. And so there's a lot of diagnostic tools they have at their fingertips to kind of start to move in a, in a better direction and then try out a new tool. Don't be afraid. Take a take a field and say, I'm going to I'm going to use a different t- way of managing my nitrogen on this field. I'm going to subscribe to one of these services that it's available through the commercial and just and see how that works and and get some confidence of that it does or doesn't. Either way, you know, there's a lot of tailoring that needs to be done on the individual field and farm. There's no perfect answer here. Obviously, <laughs> it's uh, everybody is at a different starting place and the need may be different, but uh, opportunity is certainly there. Well, the best of luck in your quest to continually pursue these uh, decision-making tools that will lend to greater nitrogen use efficiency in our crop production, and it was a pleasure to have you here on the K-State campus once again. Newell, thank you so much for your time and your input. Thank you, Eric. He's Newell Kitchen, USDA Agricultural Research Service soil scientist, and he is based out of the University of Missouri in Columbia once more. He talked about enhancing corn nitrogen use as part of his ongoing work at the Nitrogen Use Efficiency Conference at Kansas State University this week, and we'll have more from the conference after the break. This is Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we have more information that was passed along at the 2018 Nitrogen Use Efficiency Conference hosted by Kansas State University, and again, welcoming in numerous specialists in the area of soil and crop fertility management in to talk about this topic from the Midwest and from the Central Plains as well. One of the individuals early on the program spoke on the potential environmental outcomes associated with our nitrogen application and focusing on the timing there. She is from the University of Wisconsin, an extension soil fertility specialist there, and it's our pleasure to visit with Carrie Lebowski. Carrie, first of all, a little bit about your background. You've been at UW for a while? Yes, I've been at UW for 14 years now and uh, working as an extension specialist there and then also previously at Michigan State University for a few years. Well, welcome to K-State. This topic, environmental outcomes or impacts or consequences of end use, what's the general drift of the topic? Well, we're under increasing pressure throughout the Midwest with the amount of nitrogen we're applying to corn. We know it's getting into our surface water systems, groundwater systems, and so there's just a lot of pressure on farmers uh, to change practices. And one practice that they can work on is related to time of application and how does that affect you know, how much nitrogen could be lost. And what we found, this is a really neat study. It was eight states uh, in the Midwest that participated in the study. And we all did the same protocol, looking at nitrogen application that was made at plant or a split application with 40 pounds applied at plant and the remainder uh, at side dressing. And we evaluated this environmental outcomes 
point by looking at the amount of nitrogen remaining in the soil profile after harvest. Because if it's left over from the crop, in many of our environments, it's going to be lost. Um, you know, rainfall over winter, uh, it'll get lost. And wanted to kind of use that as a, a guide for the environmental aspect. And we found that when we looked at those timings at plant versus split, that there was more nitrogen remaining in the soil profile with the split application. And we dug into that a little bit deeper to find out what was going on, and we determined that the same amount of nitrogen was being taken up into the crop at economic optimum end rates. And therefore, we can conclude that with the at-plant application timing, we lost nitrogen early in the season, and the split application timing, it was left over to be lost after the season. Uh, So it's not a matter of if we're going to lose nitrogen, it's more a matter of when, and that's how timing influences it. The second part of the study that we also looked at was to evaluate, relative to the economic optimum end rate, how much nitrogen can be lost or is left over from the system. And we found that if a grower is applying at the economic optimum end rate, that's where they're making their most money off of fertilizer, that the amount of nitrogen left in the soil is no different than if they didn't apply any nitrogen. And so that's really nice because that means we can, it's a good message. We can profitably produce corn and have not a whole lot of impact on the environment. We do have a lot of control other things, you know, there's our four R's of nutrient management, right rate, right source, right time, right place. We got to get those in line, but it doesn't mean that we need to have artificially lower yields uh, at low end rates and low yields to meet environmental goals. That latter point is probably as important as anything, although when you talk to producers about bringing back in rates to a certain level and uh, convincing them that there will be no sacrifice and yield, that, that sometimes is a tough sell. But this research would seem to confirm that concept. Yes, it does. Um, you know, we're, we looked at profitability with all of this, uh, and many growers do find that they find that university-suggested rates are they think are are too low compared to what they've been doing. Uh, But with 49 sites um, over three growing seasons throughout the Midwest, you know, it supports that, you know, we can have profitable production. Thinking about other variables, uh, what cropping systems were you looking at here? Uh, Largely conservation tillage, no-till? Were you looking at conventional till or a a mix of the above? Uh, There was a mix. There was no-till and chisel sites. I don't think we had any uh, full with tillage uh, practices. And the previous crop most often was uh, soybean. And there was a handful of uh, different things. Like in North Dakota, I think uh, it might have been like sunflower one year. What about the end source? Does that make a difference in any of this? Well, end source can make a difference. In this study, in order to you know control a certain amount of factors so we can really focus on timing, we used ammonium nitrate as the, the nitrogen source. We were broadcast applying that. We used ammonium nitrate because it, it doesn't have volatilization issues like urea. So we could focus on what the timing is doing rather than changing up sources. But growers should really be thinking about managing, you know, regardless of what source they're using, uh, managing that properly to minimize the amount of nitrogen loss that they have. So timing, once again, is a variable to consider here, but that's part of the whole picture, isn't it? In regard to keeping nitrogen or any other crop application, for that matter, on the field and not in the environment where it might cause consequences. It, yeah, timing is very important. And, you know, things that we, we've known for a while, but this study reinforces, is on sites with sandy soils where you can have a lot of nitrate leaching. We do need to have in-season applications. That's, you know, to put it on a plant, you know you're going to lose it. Another uh, place where we sometimes have challenges are very poorly drained sites where we have a denitrification losses, like these clay pan soils you might find in Missouri. Moving those to in-season applications is probably more, more prudent. One interesting thing we found is that on tile drain sites, like you might find um, Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, is that at-plant applications were actually more profitable than, than the split application timing. So it, it really depends on a grower knowing their, their soil, uh, their drainage, uh, knowing their field. You know, 
fields aren't flat, you know, and knowing, you know, does most of the field drain poorly and a little good stuff, or is it mostly good and I got this little small area that's a problem, and thinking about how they can manage across the field a little differently. Uh, And producers are rather conscientious about uh, input management to begin with, but here's an area, do you think that uh, more progress could be made by individual producers as they think about their end management? That's a good question, and I could really only answer that from uh, my Wisconsin standpoint because those are the growers I work with most. The growers are very conscious, of, especially in this current economic environment, about uh, cost of production. But there are still a lot of growers that think of nitrogen as uh, a bit of cheap insurance and that maybe put a little extra on um, to hedge their their bets. But I, I do think as we do more of these trials and, and educate more and, and show what, what we actually know about uh, profitable production, that growers start you know, moving the dial a little bit to a point where they're seeing more profitability with, with a little bit less nitrogen than maybe they've had used in the past. It really works in tandem. Carrie, thank you for a quick summary of your work. It's good to have you here at K-State for this conference, and enjoy the rest of it. Thank you very much. She's Carrie Leboski, and she is a soil fertility specialist with the Cooperative Extension Service at the University of Wisconsin. Once more, she presented the findings of their study covering eight states in total in the Midwest, and they looked at the the, uh, potential environmental outcomes that would be aligned with nitrogen application timing with some quite intriguing results along that line. She's one of the presenters at the 2018 Nitrogen Use Efficiency Conference, which is being hosted on the Kansas State University campus this week. And just as a footnote to this topic of nitrogen application timing, K-State agronomists, in fact, have recent research in this area conducted by Dave Mingle and Ray Acevedo. It was part of an overall evaluation of corn yield response to nitrogen application timing and rate where they measured the impact of the end rate and the timing of the application on yield, on profitability, and on end uptake in high-yielding corn production situations. They also determined if the use of split application systems can improve the nitrogen use efficiency compared to the fixed-rate system of using the current end rate recommendations applied early in the growing season. They conducted experiments at four locations in Kansas, specifically scanned Partridge, and Rossville, all on irrigated sites, and a location at Sterling, which was a dryland corn setup. What they found in some is that the in-loss potential of the sites differed significantly, and they said this is an issue that Kansas producers are likely to observe across their farms as well. They went on to say that intensive in-management systems can improve the use efficiency without sacrificing yield, that by implementing the split-in applications. But they also, in their write-up, pointed out the value of leaning on a trained agronomist to help a producer assess the end needs throughout the growing season and determine the right time and rate of that end application. If you'd like to have a look at Ray and Dave's entire study on, again, evaluation of corn yield response to nitrogen application timing and rate, go to agronomy.ksu.edu and search for corn nitrogen application timing. That should get you there. And by the way, on tomorrow's broadcast, we'll have another subject that was presented at this Nitrogen Use Efficiency Conference this week. That from Oklahoma State University's Brian Arnall. He talked about achieving greater end use efficiency through plant genetics, specifically referring to wheat. Interesting conversation with Brian, and you'll hear it tomorrow here on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and we continue on now with today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. More movement on the farm bill process. U.S. Senate Agriculture Committee Chairman Pat Roberts of Kansas and Ranking Member Debbie Stabenow of Michigan announced yesterday that the Senate has voted to move forward with the 2018 Farm Bill Conference Committee. The senators who will serve on that committee include the chairman, Pat Roberts, uh, also on the Republican side, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, Senator John Boozman of Arkansas, Senator John Hovind of North Dakota, and Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa. On the Democrat side, including uh, in addition to Debbie Stabenow out of Michigan, Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, Also, Senator Sherrod Brand of Ohio and uh, Senator Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota. Back on June the 28th, the Senate passed its version of the Farm Bill on an 86 to 11 vote. That was the most votes a Senate Farm Bill has ever received. The uh, conference committee will be composed of members of the House and Senate, of course. The House conferees were announced earlier this month. They include Representative Roger Marshall of Kansas. A public meeting of the conference committee will be announced at a later date date. The White House, seeking to ratchet up pressure on Beijing and prod China into further negotiations, said it would consider more than doubling its proposed tariffs on $200 billion of Chinese goods to 25 percent. That move yesterday came as talks between China and the U.S. have stalled, and Washington is looking for additional leverage. In a Monday White House meeting, President Trump dismissed the proposed 10 percent China tariff as weak, saying that people familiar with the discussions we're saying that that is and and had them bump it up the levy that is to 25 percent senior administration officials said they would ask for industry comments on a 10 percent and 25 percent tariff a final decision on the rate is not expected until september at the earliest u.s officials are confident that they have the upper hand in the trade fight with china because the u.s economy is gathering strength while the chinese economy shows signs of weakening and is more dependent on trade than the U.S. However, that confidence isn't translating into action. Preliminary talks by Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin and Chinese Vice Premier Liu He have not produced even a plan for additional negotiations. The proposed tariff increase involves large risks for the U.S. and the global economy. A 25 percent tariff would boost the cost of a range of goods the U.S. imports at a time when inflation has begun to pick up. It would become another factor for the Federal Reserve to consider as it's, it's deciding how quickly to raise interest rates. The founder of the Institute for Inter- International Economics, Fred Bergsten, that's a free trade think tank in Washington, said here it adds to inflation pressure and interest rates and would strengthen the dollar, which makes the trade situation even worse for the United States. Meantime, the first round of high-level U.S.-Japanese talks aimed at increasing free, fair, and reciprocal trade between the two countries will begin next week. U.S. and Japanese officials confirmed that this week. However, Reuters reported that Japanese Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary Yasu Toshinish Emira said that the talks are not a prelude to a two-way free trade agreement between the two countries. He further said that Japan does not intend to set any numerical targets targets on Japanese exports or imports or to reduce trade friction. Japan is likely to continue pushing for exemptions from the steel and aluminum tariffs that the Trump administration imposed in the name of national security and also expected to warn the U.S. against imposing tariffs on autos and auto parts. That meeting could set up a discussion between the president and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe if they're able to meet on the sidelines of the U.N. General Assembly in September, according to some observers. And U.S. Senator Deb Fisher of Nebraska praised the Senate's passage of her amendment that would extend the electronic logging device waiver for livestock haulers by one year while she continues working to make the hours of service requirements more flexible. She worked with Senate Commerce Committee leaderships, uh, Chairman John Thune and Ranking Member Bill Nelson, to include her ELD amendment in the minibus appropriations bill that has now passed the Senate. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update, and standing by with that 
is Greg Akagi. Greg? Jen Galloway, Competitive Exhibits Director at the Kansas State Fair, is joining us. And Jen, coming up during the Kansas State Fair on Tuesday, September the 11th, is the Invent a Heart Healthy Food Competition, which is being sponsored by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Can you tell us more about the event? This competition is a way for us to showcase the use of heart-healthy soy products. The exhibitors can enter a food that they have used at least half a cup of a soy-based product. It's a great competition to display the importance of Kansas soybeans from the farm to the table. And in the entry information, they have a list of soy foods or soy products that they can use during the competition. They must have a pre-entry that is required for this. That date is by August 15th. And other than that, the only requirements are they are pretty simple. They have to have a proof of purchase showing that they have purchased some soy products. And then they have to provide us with a recipe that shows how much of that product they use. There are three options for entry, the dessert entries, the main dish or entree, and the quick and easy snack. And for the judging criteria, how, how are they going to look at that? Uh, I, I would think one would be the use of soy products, but what else are they going to be looking at? That is correct. They also are going to look at the flavor of the finished product and then the ease of preparation based off of um, the recipe that they turn in with their entry. And you usually get pretty good number of entries into this as well that usually also get some really good recipes too. We've had some good recipes in the past. We do keep the winning recipes, and then the fair and also the Kansas Soybean Commission can use those to make um, cookbooks so that other people can try making these um, healthy snacks and foods. Once again, it is Tuesday, September the 11th, the Invent a Heart Healthy Food Competition, sponsored by the Kansas Soybean Commission. And if they'd like to enter, what is the best way they can do that? The best way is for exhibitors to go on our website at kansasstatefair.com. And as an exhibitor, they'll access the food competitions, and they can do either an online entry or a paper entry. And again, the deadline for that is August 15th. All right, Jen, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. You have a good day. That is Jen Galloway, Competitive Exhibits Director at the Kansas State Fair, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Many thanks, Greg. And we'll return after you hear this. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Agriculture Today is back now, as is K-State Research and Extension horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd, our guest on this week's K-State Horticulture segment and with the latest briefing on what bugs are active in our lawns and gardens out there. And in a way, the usual suspects with a couple of additions to the list here, Raymond, but we last time talked of a handful of beetles of various types that are getting after it out there. Japanese beetle, elm leaf beetle, where are they standing? Yeah, the Japanese beetles uh, should eventually be in decline, but they will be laying eggs, females will lay eggs in the soil, and then you get the grub stage. And that's when you hopefully were applied your your merit or midicloprid or whatever you're using for turf grass or early in May or June. So when those eggs hatch, it'll kill those grubs. If you didn't do that, then you run the risk of uh, grub damage in your turf grass, especially if it's irrigated. Uh, you can use products like Dilox, but they don't last as long. Uh, they will get those third end stars. Uh, and then the, the elm leaf beetles are just devastating this year. We have a number of trees on campus that are pretty much 80% defoliated. The adults should be out right now feeding. And if you can preserve your elm tree, if it hasn't been over 50% defoliated, you can spray with an insecticide, the, the typical 
pyrethroids or malathion or orthene will kill them. But again, it's if the tree is over 50% defoliated, don't even bother at this point. And generally, the question I get is, well, will it kill the tree? On these large elms, it's probably not going to do much damage. Uh, several years of repetitious defoliation could become a problem, but not just one. It really is cosmetic at this point. So. At this point, it's cosmetic, and you got to weigh the risk and benefits. And, and by spraying, you're really not going to preserve the aesthetic quality of your tree. All right. And squash bugs, we got into those last time as well in our gardens. And are they still in high numbers out there? They are, Eric. Uh, and people that are growing pumpkins need to be aware because they love to feed on pumpkins. And I think most plants in the cucurbit taste, and they're not really a big pest on watermelon, as we've seen. But, you know, the eggs are laid on leaf underside. They're red. Uh, the nymphs will be hatching. They're initially pale, then they're gray. And then the adults will come out. And typically, you see the nymphs and the adults together feeding. But, yeah, when the pumpkins start maturing, fruiting, cantaloupe, honeydew, uh, zucchini, all that group. So you need to be out there if you want to protect your pumpkins from damage from squash bug. And it's going to take multiple applications. And sometimes you have to add a surfactant or spreader sticker because the cuticle of the adult is very waxy and it's hard to get the material to stick on it. So, But you've got to be persistent. Some people will vacuum them up. Some will handpick them. So there are other non-chemical means of dealing with them. But by all means, do deal with them if you value your cucurbit crops from here on out. Absolutely, Eric, yes. Now let's introduce some other pests that are getting after it out there. Lace bugs. You know, Eric, this is the first year I've... Generally, lace bugs are a secondary pest. We see them on sycamore, catoni aster, azaleas. But this is the first year I've actually seen them kill plants like aster. Uh, we've seen aster plants. This is a bloom, has a very beautiful perennial. Uh, just wipe them out. When I mean wipe them out, I mean they were just dead. There were so many lace bugs. Uh, we're also seeing them on like eggplant and other, other plants out there. Like I said, it's been a banner year for insects, but this is the first year I've actually seen lace bugs be what I call a, uh, a primary pest and have to deal with it because they have, even in my, own, in my own yard, they kill three out of our four asters. So what is one looking for as far as lace bug activity, in appearance and uh, their movement and so forth? Good question, Eric. They, they do resemble spider mite damage, uh, but they do, will feed on the leaf undersides. We've seen them on the top of leaves. Uh, the nymphs are distinctly black, but the adults are silvery and they have a lacy appearance. That's their, their common name. And if you look on the leaf underside, there's these black dots, and that's their fecal deposits. Uh, so look for bleached leaves, stippling or speckling, we call that, and then get really close and look on the leaf underside. And if you see these black nymphs or shiny, silvery, lacy-looking bugs, that's lace bugs. And are they easily disposed of then? Well, before they cause damage, I mean, we normally recommend a force of water spray, mm -hmm. But the levels we're seeing, it does warrant using like an oil or a soap to begin with uh, because, again, they are causing substantial damage to a number of plants. Speaking of tiny pests which cause problems, we should slip in a word here about spider mites as well. On our tomatoes, yes, with the heat, they just perk right along, don't they? Yeah. At this point, Eric, the tomatoes should be setting fruit. If you still have spider mites, maybe a force of water spray will knock them off per se. But at this, if, if your tomatoes are setting fruit, you're getting yield, not really much of a concern. And, that, and that's why I say sometimes you got to look at the, the risk and the benefits. At this point, there really is, might not be a benefit of spraying. Unless your tomatoes are still coming on and have not set fruit or there's no yield, then you might want to deal with them at that point. Lastly, the cicadas and uh, their uh, night music, if you will. <laughs> they are around and... Because of their presence, so too are the cicada killers, you tell us. Well, when you talk about cicada, we're not talking about the 13, 17. You were talking about the annual or dog face cicada, which we have every year. And, of course, the, they get in the trees and they serenade each other, the males. But as a consequence of that, the cicada killer will be start showing appearance. And cicada killer is a large wasp, and it really freaks people out because they wonder if this thing's going to bite them or stuff. The, the males are extremely territorial. They'll get in front of your face, but the females are very docile. Sure. The females will grab a dog face cicada. 
uh, bring it back, sting it, and that per- and she'll provision her her offspring with that as a food source. But the males are flying around and darting around, and they get in people's face, and of course that uh, really stresses people out somewhat. But they won't sting you because the males don't have a stinger. But as the dog face cicadas are out there, we should be seeing more of the cicada killers out there because the dog face cicada uh, is the food source uh, for the cicada killers, the offspring after the females lay the eggs. And these, these nests are in the ground. They can be like a turf grass, sandy areas. And so one of the things we recommend in a sandy area, just kind of rake it around. And it'll agitate them. Sprays sometimes are worth in the turf grass, but the, probably the best thing is contact the extension office or your county extension agent and tell them the situation so they can provide a more accurate recommendation of what to do at that point, yeah, because you don't want to spray inadvertently. And again, the males, they're just a nuisance at this point. And that was the question. They are basically a nuisance and nothing more. So if one chooses to put up with them, they're not going to cause any undue harm otherwise, are they? except to the cicadas themselves. The, the only harm, if somebody uh, grabs on or steps on a female, they will sting you and it hurts. So that's where you get If you have them around there, watch your children, your pets, because uh, if the female's provoked, she will sting. Duly noted. And Raymond, once again, thanks for stopping over and providing this good information. Always enjoy it. Look forward to our next meeting, Eric. He's Raymond Cloyd, horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension and our featured guest on this week's K-State Horticulture segment. And with that, this Thursday edition comes to a close. As always, we thank you for being along with us and invite you to tune in this same time tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.